All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another 15 and 15. Today's topic is strategic plan alignment, retention and persistence. And what I mean by that is uh, if you pay attention at all, you'll know that retention is one of the big things that we're working on here at Plymouth State. Um, so we built a module of our professional development um, series, which is called Design Forward, around the idea of retention. And what I'm going to present to you today are the highlights from that module condensed into 15 minutes. Um, and I am also going to, if I can locate my chat, there it is. Um, put in the chat the web page to the actual module itself, because that's where you're going to want to go if any of this captures your attention. Uh, you'll be able to go there and, and see the full curriculum. But basically, I was reading a book um, for fun, and the book uh, is called Relationship Rich Education, a really great higher ed book. And it mentioned uh, this Oakton College um, initiative in Illinois, um, where they basically did a bunch of research on retention and persistence, and they created, unfortunately, it's called the Faculty Persistence Project for Student Persistence, which sounds a little bit like a joke in terms of its name, but um, they did an amazing thing. Um, in, this, uh, they, in this initiative, the classes that were participating in the initiative um, showed that those sections had more than 24% more likelihood of the students in those classes to return to that college the next semester. That is a huge positive effect. Um, and it was even more for some historically marginal, marginalized students like African-American students at their college. So um, I thought, well, how did they how did they do that? Like, if I mean, we're trying to get, a, I think, like a 5% bump in retention at Plymouth State. They got a 24% bump in retention. And I was wondering, like, well, what did they do? Was it some kind of, you know, magic? Or did they, was it just like, oh, everyone's just going to work a lot more, you know, something that's not sustainable. But it turns out um, they did some really sustainable things. They basically created a contract with four items. Um they all agreed, all the professors, yeah, that every course that um, participated, for those courses, they would learn all of the students' names. They would return an assignment to each student with formative, success-oriented feedback early in the term. They would articulate high standards, but they would also send a message that students who are struggling to meet those standards were not doomed, but they could give them ways that they could improve to meet those standards. And they would also agree to meet one-on-one -on -one with every student in the course, the professor would meet one-on-one -on -one for a 10 minute conversation. Those are the four things that they did to achieve a 24% bump. I'm not suggesting we have to do these exact four things, but what I, what I was shocked with was like, crap, that bar is really low. That's not that hard, right? What if I actually researched all the things that give a bump and put them out there for faculty so that um, we could increase the amount of times that we're doing the things that the data shows us actually results in students staying in school. So uh, the website for this module, which I already shared, is where you're going to find all the information on these um, interventions. But what I did is I, I read huge reams of literature and I ended up um, after I finished, you know, I took notes on all of them, then I grouped those notes according to the dominant themes that I was seeing. So these are the seven areas that I suggest we look at if, it, and again, there's all sorts of ways to be a good teacher. These are specifically if you want to bump retention, right? If that's your goal, these are the seven areas you're gonna look at. If you go to the website I shared earlier, um, what you will see is a definition for each of these areas. So, you know, what do you mean by instructional delivery? So if you're curious about like, what are these things? What, do you, what counts as mental health? You can look at those um, definitions that are there. Uh, what I'm going to go through now really quickly, though, is what um, the like sort of one or two major ways that you can work inside of these areas um, to get that retention bump. So for example, with instructional delivery, 
Um, the biggest thing that the research shows us will be no surprise is active learning. Um, that active learning, um, and it's great because lots of us are like, oh, I always do that. But like, did you know that the data fully supports all that crap that you're doing that you just think is good teaching? The data actually supports that it actually does make a difference. So what I've shared on the handout for this, or if you go to the um, website and you look through the slide deck, you can get all these links. Um, a, a really great place to look for more active learning techniques is the Cornell Active Learning site because it may be that you feel like you're doing active learning all the time, but maybe you only have like two or three tricks in your trick box, um, or and maybe you don't know the full range of active learning practices that um, can be demonstrated to uh, improve retention. So I would recommend Cornell Active Learning as a good place um, to go. The other thing is that the data really is quite clear that active learning makes a difference. So if, for example, um, you are doing active learning one out of every four classes, the data is pretty pretty convincing um, that your students are, are not as likely to be retained as if you were doing it more often than that. Um, the other thing that's important here is that we're not just talking about you, right? Especially the people who are here listening to this today or watching this recording. We're also talking about your colleagues. So the way that this module was originally designed was for an entire program or AU to participate, because part of what we need is for the people who are doing lots of this stuff to start making contracts with some folks who may be not doing quite as much. Not that everyone has to do active learning all the time, but you may have some folks in your area who are not really doing active learning at all. So is it possible to make a contract where you say we all agree um, at least once a week to use some of the active learning techniques to engage our students? Um, so uh, feedback, no surprise to hear that formative assessment um, is absolutely recommended if retention is your goal. To learn more about formative assessment, you can go uh, to the module. But one of the things uh, that I would recommend that was very in, instrumental in the Oakland group was not just that you do formative uh, assessment, but that you do it within the first three weeks of class. Um, and remember the key with formative assessment is not just that you're giving them feedback so they can revise and do better. It's that you're also giving them the tools to turn that feedback into success. And you're making them believe that whatever they did on that first draft you absolutely know they are capable of success, right? So it's a two-part thing. It's giving them the content advice that they need in order to improve their work and also giving them um, the sense of self-efficacy that they need um, in order to achieve it. So that's a two-pronged part of the formative uh, feedback and it makes a big, big difference to retention. Uh, learning outcomes, we all know probably that they need to be clear and that you should probably have some, right? It's one of the ways our students trust that they're not wasting their time, right? That you know you're going to learn something. But uh, really what the data shows us is that um, learning outcomes should not just be something that should be achieved. They should actually be part of the language of the course. So you, your students should understand the learning outcomes. They should understand why they're written the way that they are. They should be allowed to provide input on those learning outcomes and maybe possibly even help shape them. Uh, the data suggests that it's not enough to have learning outcomes because if your students don't understand and engage with them, you're not gonna get that metacognitive bump that you get. Um, when they really understand why they're doing what they're doing. So we have some uh, things that you can do real easily here in the slide deck and in the module that can help involve your students in their learning outcomes. I think there's even a, um, a sample assignment there that you can do with students um, about the learning outcomes in your course. Um, supporting and removing barriers. So supporting students and removing barriers. Um, one of the easiest ways to think about this is to think about what gaps exist for your students. Um, what are the sort of chasms that open up as they're trying to access your content? So that could be anything from they can't afford the textbook to um, they have you know uh, an illness that prevents them from getting to class. So what is it that you can do, not just to do a great job with your content, 
but to close the gaps that maybe really aren't related to your discipline at all, but are keeping your students from learning. Um, so what you'll see if you go to the module, you can look at things like the Complete College America strategies um, that explain some of the ways that folks uh, who especially teach students in high risk situations, like for example, community college students who are wrestling with all sorts of issues that can sometimes prevent them from getting to class or being successful. Um, an example of this also would be the OER resolution that we have at Plymouth State now that asks faculty to look at low and no cost learning materials. Um, this also includes things like um, hunger and homelessness, uh, which generally faculty, uh, especially PhDs, have been trained to think of as not our issue, right? Um, our issue is American history or whatever it is. Um, but the fact is that you cannot move the needle on retention if you're not looking at these kinds of barriers and gaps. So again, if all you wanna do is teach chemistry, teach chemistry. But if you wanna retain students, you will have to look at supporting and removing, um, supporting students and removing barriers. Next is student belonging. We hear lots about this word. It's kind of the new buzzword in higher ed, and it is for very, very good reason. The data is really conclusive that if students feel like they belong both at a, in a class, they'll do better in that class. And at a university, they will be more likely to stay at the university um, through to graduation. So there's different ways that um, belonging gets uh, defined. We have a 15 and 15 focusing just on belonging, which is on Wednesday. So I, and, uh, you can come back. All of these can be, you know, whole classes in and of themselves. Right. Um, but we've got some stuff here um, defining what belonging looks like. Right. Because. Uh, there's ways of thinking about belonging in terms of cognition, affect, and behavior, right? What does belonging look like in the way uh, students will think? What does belonging look like in the way students will behave, right? Um, in the way students feel. So there's different ways that you can attack um, belonging. And then we have all sorts of wonderful um, examples in the module for how to foster uh, a, a sense of inclusion in your classes. What this definitely demonstrated to me when I was learning about this data was that anybody who thinks this is touchy feely, loosey goosey stuff um, that you don't have time for because you got to focus on your calculus or whatever, um, you are simply failing <laughs> at, in ways that you could be succeeding uh, to teach your students. Because without a sense of belonging, the data is pretty clear that students will succeed um, at a much lower rate academically in your class. So it is worth the time that it takes to build that kind of community in your class. Next is uh, relevance and value, helping your students understand the relevance of what they're learning and the value of what they're learning. I think this is one of the ways that cluster learning really hits it out of the park because interdisciplinarity, project-based learning and open education are all about connecting the academic world to the world that surrounds the academy, right? The, what we would always call the real world. Um, so if you're doing cluster learning, I think you're probably doing really, really better, um, really well on this one. And we have lots of examples in the module for uh, things that help us move into this terrain of doing uh, what the data generally calls authentic work with your students, right? Instead of jumping through hoops or doing exercises, which, you know, occasionally, is, is worth it. But how can you engage in the real scholarly and professional work of your field in authentic ways with your students? It makes a big difference in retention and persistence. And finally, no surprise, uh, I think to most of us at this point, and this may not have been the case 10 years ago that you would have seen mental health on a, on a data-driven list like this, but it's absolutely clear now that the data tells us that uh, if a professor uh, focuses and accepts responsibility for addressing mental health as a challenge that students might face, that that is going to improve uh, what we call the throughput rates of those students, their ability to pass the class, get a good grade, and not withdraw or fail. Um, that doesn't mean you need to be a counselor. So uh, we've got all sorts of stuff. First of all, we've got the data that shows that we're not 
anymore, sadly, talking about the one or two students who may have been lost to a mental health challenge. We are talking about actually the majority of your students now. That's why it's uh, become a really important retention and persistence issue. Um, but in the uh, module, we can share things like uh, the Jed Foundation, which does suicide prevention. They've created a whole faculty packet on how faculty can um, help students with their mental health crises, because we don't want you to counsel your students. We don't want you to become um, uh, uh, you know, crisis counselors. What we want you to know are what are the signs and how do you reach out? Um, a good way is to use the new CoLab support module that you can integrate with Canvas, but there's a whole bunch of techniques. So because we're gonna end on time and this is the end of it, I wanted to introduce you to those uh, seven areas and to that module website. Um, Martha will also be posting a handout that goes with this that has like probably the best reading on each of these areas um, that you might wanna take a look at. But the bottom line is basically uh, if faculty do some or even better, all of these things in adjacency to your content work, you will definitely have uh, better academic success um, and outcomes for your students. So with that, I will stop recording and I will stick around if anybody has any questions, but thank you all for coming and stopping recording. Okay. I think I stopped it. No, I didn't. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm going to stop it now.